morning, brothers and sisters and young people. To start our exhortation this morning, I'm going to read a section of verses from Romans chapter 6. There Paul writes, For when you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin, and having become slaves to God, you have your fruit to holiness, and the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Recently at work, I spent a day finishing a project with one of my coworkers who I only see very sporadically throughout the year. So while we worked together that day, we spoke about what we'd been up to and how our lives had changed since we'd last seen each other. He asked about how Josie was growing up, my daughter. When I finished telling him about all the, the learning and the changes that she'd been going through and how wonderful and rewarding it had been, he paused for a moment before responding and he said, maybe I should have a kid. What am I doing otherwise? Basically, I'm just being selfish. And you could tell he was putting a lot of thought into this. And while it's obviously possible to be incredibly unselfish with no children, or to have children and still act selfish, for him, in the way he was considering it, he felt like he was only living his life for himself. And there was no other party that was making him um, live for them. So I knew exactly what he was talking about when he expressed that. And this conversation reminded me of another one um, that I'd had over a year ago uh, with uh, Brother Craig at our meeting back when we used to meet at the hall. Lacey and I had recently had Josie, um, mostly Lacey. I, I was there. Uh, but anyway, Craig was asking about the transition from having no children to having a child. And in talking about it, he expressed the sentiment that he wanted to have kids, but also he and Ellen enjoyed having the freedom to do what they wanted when they wanted, whether visiting friends or traveling or helping the Ecclesia. And the reason I bring it up once again is that as with my conversation with my coworker, I knew exactly what Craig was referring to because I had the same thoughts pri prior to having a daughter. And one of the things we talked about that I was trying to relate was that this mindset, which makes complete logical sense beforehand, goes away as soon as you have a child. Of course, being a parent is a massive responsibility and it creates a huge amount of new work that was not previously present in your life, but you don't think of it in those terms because of the love and care that you have towards that new addition in your family and that new relationship that you now have. So my point is, I convinced Craig to have kids. No, that's not my point at all. My actual point is that to varying degrees, we have this same experience in all of our long-term relationships, whether it's our relationship to our spouse, to our children, our relationship with our parents, our long-term friends, our coworkers that we develop relationships with over time, and our ecclesial family. In order to maintain and be successful in these relationships, we always give up some portion of our own freedom, some measure of what we would want to do is sacrificed in order to please others. And the same thing is of course true and should be true of our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ and with our heavenly father. In order to have effective, healthy relationships, we know that we have to make sacrifices. We often have to set aside what we would want to do to make time for our spouses, for our children, and for God. However, in all those cases, if we love our spouse, if we love our children, we love our parents, and we love our Heavenly Father, then the trade-offs are worth it. It doesn't become a negative thing in our lives that we have to give some things up. So those last few verses in Romans chapter 6, which I read uh, a few moments ago at the beginning of our exhortation this morning, show us what I'm referring to using the metaphor of slavery. We're told that we were formerly slaves to sin, but now having been set free from sin, we're slaves to God. 
So Paul here is describing the transition that takes place in a believer's life when they choose to follow Christ, to be baptized and to serve God instead of sin. And in doing so, he says that we go through, sorry, we go immediately from one type of slavery to another. There's never a moment in our lives when we're not a slave. No interval of time between these two slaveries when we're in some kind of neutral territory. Through Christ, the shackles of sin have been broken and we're able to walk out of the prison and directly into a new slavery to God and to righteousness. But make no mistake, like the things we give up when we start new relationships, this is a joyful and privileged thing. It's not unlike getting married or having a child in that you're immediately being enslaved to a whole host of new responsibilities toward that other party. But we don't talk about it in those terms. We celebrate weddings, we celebrate children being born, and likewise, we celebrate baptisms. So in the same way that we need to look to the needs of others in order for our natural relationships to be successful, we need to trust and obey our Heavenly Father in order for our relationship with him to be one which bears fruit to holiness. That's how Paul puts it for us in these verses. This is why there's no transition period. There's no limbo where we've been made free from sin without being slaves to God. Because as soon as we're no longer trying to be slaves to God, we're once more making ourselves slaves to sin. And none of this is to say that we won't sin once we realize this, but instead what he's telling them is that our attitude towards sin should change dramatically. One of the more difficult aspects of trying to follow Christ and to serve God is our desire to compare ourselves to other believers, to judge other believers, and to see the failures of ourselves or of those around us as failures of God's righteousness, rather than measuring ourselves up to the perfect example of Christ. And I had some experience with this in organizing the senior CYC for many years um, for Kitchener and then for Cambridge. And one issue that I sometimes ran into in having candid conversations with young people was they could become discouraged by the apparent hypocrisy of other members of the Ecclesia. I would hear things like, that brother talks about this from the podium, but I know what they're actually like. Or this brother or sister or this other young person does this in their personal life. So who are they to tell me what I should be doing? What they were missing and what is difficult for us because of human nature is that it's not hypocritical to know what you should do and still struggle with it. No longer being a slave to sin does not mean that we're magically freed from all practice of sin. You and I, of course, still sin. But what Paul means is we've been freed from the reign, dominion, and mastery that sin once possessed over our lives. This is where slavery to God becomes vital because Jesus freed us from sin, not so that we could continue to live in it anyway, but so that we could strive to live according to the will of his father, which is of course what he did perfectly. This is why in verse 22 of that section in Romans six, when Paul tells us that we've been set free from sin, it uses what's called a passive participle in the original Greek. So the verb there, if Paul had used an active voice, it would mean that we set ourselves free from sin somehow, but instead what it's saying is the total opposite. We were originally passive in this liberation and the Lord Jesus Christ was the one who was active, acting out the will of his heavenly father. Paul tells us elsewhere in Romans five and the eighth verse that God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The action took place before we had any opportunity to somehow earn it on our own. So our slavery to God actually grants us tremendous freedom in other aspects of our lives. We're going to look at a couple of verses about that freedom. Christ tells his disciples in John chapter 8 and reading there at the 36th verse that if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. In the letter to Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, in the third chapter, reading there at the 17th verse, it tells us, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. 
In the letter to the Galatians, chapter 5 and verse 1, Paul writes, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Of course, he's referring to that slavery to sin that he'd mentioned before in Romans. And a little further down, in verse 13, he continues, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And finally, another section of verses in Romans chapter 8, and beginning at the first verse, we're told, There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, he condemns sin in the flesh, and that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So how do we do this practically, brothers and sisters and young people? What can we do to ensure that we are walking according to the Spirit? Well, we have to look to Christ. We have to look to that ultimate example of what it means to fully embrace the will of God in all of our thoughts, all of our words, and our actions. The phrase, what would Jesus do, has become so ubiquitous that it's lost much of its power, because we've probably heard it so much. In the world, it's taken on a shallow application of having two options in front of us and asking, well, which of these options would Jesus take, without necessarily giving thought to what situations Christ would put himself in to begin with. Not simply, how would Jesus react, but having a much deeper understanding of how Jesus would act, what he would do, and what he was really all about. Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, and this is the first verse, he says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So really he's telling them to be an imitator of Christ. And in 1 Peter 2, and the 21st verse, Peter writes, For this you have been called, because Jesus also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. And finally, in 1 John and chapter 2, and reading the 6th verse, we're told, Whoever says he abides in him, that is Christ, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So what was Jesus all about? I'm sure we've all read the account of his ministry in the Gospels over and over. I'm sure our Sunday school students could make lists of all the things that Jesus did and many of the things that he said and taught. So what are we doing to walk in the way that he walked? I think we're able to break, break down a lot of what Jesus put his effort into, into two categories. The overriding goal being that he was trying to do the will of his heavenly father. But the actual actions that he did fall under one of these two subheadings. And the first one is spreading the gospel. Jesus was always talking about God, talking about God's plan, talking about what people needed to do to change or stop doing in order to partake in that plan. And the second thing is helping people. Jesus built relationships with people. He fed them. He healed them. He sat down and ate with those whose society deemed undesirable. In John chapter 13, and beginning at the 13th verse, he tells his disciples, You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And he was, of course, also excellent at combining those two aspects of his ministry. He would heal someone and then talk to them in the crowd about how forgiveness of sins was the ultimate healing that God could offer. He would feed a multitude, but later tell them that he was the bread. And he finishes that particular speech in John 6 by saying, 
This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Talking about that hope that we have. Jesus' ministry is the perfect marriage of instruction and action, always going above and beyond what he was telling people to do so that he could be the perfect example for them and for us. He didn't expect people to care about the message just because the message existed, even though they should have if they'd heard it. Instead, he went out of his way and did things that showed God's character. And then once he had their attention, he told them why he was acting that way. In our busy world, in 2021, it's difficult to imagine someone with the perfect mindset just stumbling onto our website or to social media or to our advertisements. Jesus knew that that wouldn't work and the people around us have endless distractions and more enticing options at their fingertips than they did in Jesus' day. Instead, he went out and got people interested by helping them first. And Christ acted this way because his character, which matched that of his father, compelled him to do so. So we know we have been given some specific instructions. We know God doesn't want us to lie. He doesn't want us to steal, commit adultery, covet, murder, worship idols. We know that he wants us to love him with all our heart. He wants us to love others as ourselves. Those are some simple rules that God has laid out. But those still aren't the culmination of his ultimate expectation for us. God expects us to accept his son as our savior and give our lives to him. And in so doing, we develop that character of Christ by becoming slaves to God, as Paul puts in Romans. A little further down in Romans, uh, in Romans chapter 12, and beginning at the first verse, we read, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 31, we're instructed, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 14 says, let all that you do be done with love. And in Colossians 3, verse 17, we're told, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through him. Continuing on a little further down in verse 23, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. So while it's true that God has rules that he wants us to obey, beyond that, he's far more interested in who we are than he is in what we do. Much more concerned with our character than with our education or our career or our hobbies, things that take up so much of our effort and time. Because of these things, only our character will be taken with us into eternity. In the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, and beginning at verse 8, we're told, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And Paul reiterates this truth a little further in this letter in Ephesians chapter 4. Beginning there at the 14th verse, he says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. God doesn't expect us to do a specific job or move to a certain city. God expects us to trust him, love him, and try to pattern ourselves after his son, Jesus Christ. That phrase, what would Jesus do when applied earnestly, is still the best question 
that we can ask for every decision and every action that we make. And continuing on in that letter to the Ephesians and reading chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And if you're on Sunday school, it's interesting how well our, uh, our thought for the week tied in with the exhortation this morning. So thank you very much for that. And Christ picks up on this as well, the same idea. In the Gospel of John in chapter 14, and reading there at the sixth verse, in response to Thomas asking him, how can we know the way? Jesus answers and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. If we truly believe that Jesus is the way, then Jesus can never be in the way. Our relationship with Jesus doesn't hinder us from doing things we want to do. It doesn't take away our freedom that we had previous to this relationship. Because anything that our relationship with him prevents us from doing, anything that he wouldn't do himself, isn't something that we should be doing in the first place. Much like any trepidation I had at the loss of freedom once I had a child was instantly squashed by my love for my daughter, leaving the slavery of sin involves a recognition of the amazing free gift of grace and love bestowed on us each by the Father. And this in turn reveals the tremendous freedom and comfort provided by our slavery to him. The world looks at this idea and doesn't understand it. They'd laugh at it. Why would we want to be slaves to anything? However, we know that the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. If we're striving to be like Christ, then we'll show that same love that had been shown to us, to those around us. And I truly believe that this is our best hope of creating interest in the message of the gospel in the coming kingdom. Christ continued to manifest God's love through real and tangible actions throughout his entire ministry. He went out of his way to show love to the unloved, to show kindness to those who are otherwise cast aside, to forgive those who we would not dream of forgiving. And he displayed an attitude of humility and his obedience to his father's will in all of this that he went through, culminating in his death on the cross. And Jesus carrying his own cross Toward the brutal experience that was to follow is a powerful example for us and also the ideal representation of the lofty bar that he set for us to strive for. Jesus was perfect, but we need to remember that Jesus was a man. Naturally, this crucifixion was not something that he wanted to go through. In Matthew 26 and verse 42 in the garden, we know that he prays, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Any insult anyone could call us, any physical pain we could experience, Jesus knew he was about to have that thrown on him all at once. When's the last time you did something for God that was a sacrifice for you to do? What have you given up in order to have a relationship with the Father? I know in my life, so much of my decision-making is based on what I would enjoy doing or what I wouldn't want to do. Maybe I'm not actively sinning, but what am I doing that's actively good? John chapter 15 and beginning at the ninth verse. Christ says, as the father loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants for a servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. 
a year or two ago, spending hours playing with toy horses or nays, as we call them in my house, would not have been high on my list of fun activities. You could say that I never did it. Now I play with nays all the time because I value my relationship with my daughter. Renovating one of our bathrooms just so I can immediately gut and renovate our other bathroom literally sounds like someone designed a punishment for me, but I'm happy to do it and help lace with it because I value my relationship with my wife. What sacrifices like this am I making to show that I value my relationship with my heavenly father that I have through the Lord Jesus Christ? While God has asked us to obey him, to become slaves to him rather than slaves to sin. And we need to read God's word in order to determine what he would have us do. Then we need to put what we learn about God's character into action in our lives by showing his love and striving to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly, that we can present ourselves as a living sacrifice to him. That love should be made apparent to our brothers and sisters in the way that we lift each other up instead of judging each other too harshly. The way we help those who are struggling instead of cutting them off from our lives. And the way we celebrate each other's good qualities rather than becoming jealous and looking for each other's bad qualities. And furthermore, we can be a reflection of that love that Christ showed to those in the world. Even though we can't miraculously heal them, we have an opportunity to extend the same hope to them which has been given to us. And this is what Christ placed utmost importance on above the healings and the miracles. We often look for boxes we can tick in order to know that we're serving God correctly. I did the daily readings, check. Uh, finish my Sunday school homework, check. Attend an ecclesial function, check. Oh, there's going to be a lunch, double check. Those things are all good and important. But God is looking beyond that for a change in our attitudes towards sin and a change in our character to become more like his and his sons. So to close our thoughts this morning, before we remember Christ through the emblems, I'm going to read a section of verses from Romans chapter 12. And it's about how he wants us to compose ourselves as members of Christ's body. And as we read these verses, we can think about how perfectly Christ accomplished these ideals that we read about. And of course, how we can also work on them in our own lives. So Romans chapter 12, like I mentioned, and we're going to pick it up at the ninth verse. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it's written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not be slaves to sin, but work to make yourselves slaves to God. Thank you very much.